Future Proof, the world's largest wealth festival, is coming back to Huntington Beach on September 10th to 13th. Over 3,000 finance professionals and every relevant company in fintech, asset management, and wealth management will be there. It's the one event that every wealth management professional must attend. New in 2023 is Breakthrough Meetings Program, which will be facilitating more than 10,000 one-on-one meetings. Financial advisors and LPs get your ticket free, plus a $750 reimbursement by applying for the hosted meetings program by the August 15th deadline. You heard that right. A free ticket plus 750 bucks by applying to the hosted meetings program by August 15th. Get out of the hotel meeting rooms and conference halls and instead get out into the sunshine and onto the beach. No suit or tie required. I was there last year, will be there this year, and cannot wait to go back. Get your ticket at a special discounted rate when you register at futureproof.advisorcircle.com slash meb or click on the link in the show notes. Before we get started today, I have a quick public service announcement. Cambria is currently soliciting a proxy vote from shareholders of our ETFs. Every vote is important, and we would like to request any listeners who are also shareholders to please vote. If you have any questions related to the proxy or need assistance submitting your vote, please email us at info at cambriainvestments.com, and someone from the Cambria team will assist. Or if you want to cast your vote, please call 888-490-5095. That's 888 888- Four nine zero five zero nine five. Thanks, Anthony. Welcome back to the show, Matt. It's a pleasure to be back on. Thanks for having me. What's been going on in your world, man? You went and got married. You've been running around Europe. You uh, launched new businesses. You moved to Newport. Give us a catch up. What you been up to, man? Where do we find you today? Yeah, I think most importantly, right, married to the love of my life, McKenna. Um, so we've been together since we were 18, met first week of college at USC and, uh, finally tied the knot. So we, yeah, we just got back from a honeymoon in Italy, bought a little bit of, a little bit of business along with the pleasure. So got to meet with a lot of our winery suppliers. We've got a few employees out there as well. So got to fly them out and, and get to see them in person, which is rare opportunity when you're here on the West coast. Where'd you guys go in Italy? Because I follow you on uh, Twitter and was jealously liking some of the photos. It looked pretty awesome. Where'd you guys go? So we actually flew into Zurich because that's the only direct from LAX. And then we spent a couple of days there, went down to Lake Como, beautiful, beautiful region, and then went down to Milan for a couple of days. And then we took that high speed train down to Florence and then spent most of the trip around the Florence and Tuscany area, uh, where a lot of the winery partners we work with are there, right? A lot of the Chianti producers, a lot of the Brunello producers in Montalcino, and then went all the way up onto the West Coast there in Bulgari, where a lot of the super Tuscans are. So yeah, it was awesome getting to meet a lot of the owners and CEOs of those wineries. Been on Zoom with them a dozen times, bunch of emails, so good to put a, a real face and body to the name and course get to taste some great wine at the wineries yeah we got a lot of fun memories from italy my wife speaks italian and kind of her whole family brothers and sisters all studied in bologna and so we definitely love to get over there i've never been to lake como it's on my to-do list yeah it's beautiful summer yeah well welcome back to cali you're now down south of me instead of north of me and your business has been booming. So give the listeners a little bit of an update. What do you guys do? For those who didn't listen to the first pod, we'll put the link in the show notes, but what do you guys do? And then we can kind of walk forward what's been going on in your world. Sounds great. So yeah, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Vinovest. So we're a wine and spirits investment platform that allows investors to be able to diversify their portfolios into a real asset class, a real physical asset. So we invest in actual bottles, cases, barrels of the product. We help you choose the right portfolio construction based on your goals around time horizon, goals around portfolio construction. And we hold on to it, custody it with our partners, help you ensure the physical asset as well. And then when the time comes to exit, we also help with the eventual sale. And I think last time we were on was nearly two years ago now, or maybe over two years ago. So Lots changed with the business. And I think perhaps most excitingly, uh, we started as only wine, wine and champagne, and we just launched our whiskey product. So it went from only doing scotch, and then we just branched into American whiskey as well. And we're super excited by uh, the reception that we've gotten and the partners that we've been able to 
form uh, on our on our way here. Yeah. So we're definitely going to spend some time in whiskey because you have been the recipient of me harassing you over email and asking lots of questions and being very curious and interested in this whiskey world. I mean, I, look, don't get me wrong. I like wine and I like beer, but whiskey was definitely a curiosity to me. But let's stick with wine for a minute. And listeners, you know, we've done a handful of shows on a little more alti topics, you know, wine. I think we talked about it with Professor Dimson of Triumph of the Optimist fame, some of the white papers that he put out, but also my favorite investing book, Triumph of the Optimist. And he talked about, you know, historical returns. Walk us through the last time we chatted. So 2021, definitely a pretty euphoric time in traditional public markets. You know, I, I don't know if we have a name for the period we went through recently, whether it was meme stock, COVID, shite coins, whatever it was, but it definitely was a weird period, but we seem to be on the other side of that. But here we are a couple of years later, give us an update, you know, was wine, was your world, you know, kind of zigs and zags, does its own thing, but how was it impacted by a lot of this COVID, post COVID, post public markets, on and on. Give us an update on uh, the wine world. Yeah, I, th I think COVID really helped to accelerate a lot of the I'd say digital adoption of the wine industry, right? Wine is a very traditional industry. The way most of these winemakers are making wine and distributing and working through the supply chain is the same way that they've done for decades, hundreds of years, right? They're doing what their fathers did and they're, you know, they're doing what their grandfathers did. So when all on-premise visits to wineries stopped, right, the global supply chain halted, a lot of wineries, they were forced to go online, right? And I think same in my household, probably yours too, Matt, right? We, wine consumption, alcohol consumption in general spiked up during COVID when people are stuck at home. So that led to, I think, a lot more awareness of brands, especially ones that, you know, we at you know, Vest deem to be, you know, worthy of, of holding on to for a long time. And we definitely saw some of that tailwind, right? That happened from the stimulus checks, the meme stocks, the tech boom, right? It wasn't it wasn't the explosive like 100%, 200% gains in a year that we were seeing, but we were starting to see, um, you know, the wine performance, the indices that we track go from their historical, I'd say around 10, 11% annualized return. 2021, we saw 15% returns. 2022, you know, went, was around 14%, right? So, you know, we we're able to see definitely an outperformance of the, of the benchmark in those couple of years post that boom. And now that things are slowly returning back to normal, right? Global supply chain is is getting declogged. I think we've had another sort of tailwind with this recession that we're entering into. Um, alcohol consumption in general goes up during recession. So that consumption bump that we saw during COVID has been sustained even into now mid-2023. So we've continued to ride a different sort of tailwind right now, but one that we've still continued to see in the market. I joked with you last time that I was actually just going to take delivery of all my wine and drink it as opposed to working with the appreciation. Okay, so I own 42 bottles on your website, mostly, I believe, Italian, and certainly want to get more involved. But talk to us a little bit about kind of how does it work again? Tell the listeners, you know, they come to your site, they say, okay, I'm going to buy some wine. What's their choices? How do they go about it? Do they get to pick specific bottles? All that good stuff. Give, give us the overview. Yeah, so we've got two products that we offer today. One is a more self-directed, right? For someone who does want to kind of, you know, stock pick or pick their own wine, as you say. Um, the other is for someone who just wants generalized exposure. So the vast majority of our clients, they start with the more general approach, right? They may, even if you know a lot about wine from the consumption standpoint, there are some key differences when you're looking at it as a long-term hold as an investor. So we take a look at some preferences like, you know, what type of investor profile are you? What sort of other assets do you own? You know, how long are you looking to hold this, right? Is it a you know, 10, 20 year, almost infinite type of thing? Is it a five year hold? Um, you know, what are your mandates? And that allows us and our team of Unovest to be able to construct a portfolio and recommend you wines that we think fit that mandate, right? So. Uh, we can pick from different regions, pick from different vintage years as well, because when we're looking at exiting the wine, we want the wine to be close to its sort of peak drinking window, right? When people are deeming it to be really at its maturity, then the market demand 
is not only just other investors, right? It's mainly pulled by the consumption side, selling to auction houses, retailers, restaurant groups, and, and collectors. So we'll help you pick out those wines. We store it for you. So, you know, we keep it out of mind, out of temptation as well. So you can't be drinking those bottles on, on a Friday night. And uh, we also help you insure those and keep you updated with market insights. You know, what's happening to your wine? Um, is there a big critic that rated your wine a different score? So that could lead to a price upgrade, so to say. And what's happening in the world of that region, right? If, if there's a tariff imposed on, on Italy, right? Maybe that's boosting other regions around it. So we kind of keep you updated with general market news as well as you're holding this as you know, a pretty long-term asset. Here's an idea for you. Feel free as an entrepreneur and CEO to ignore one of the ideas that I was just thinking of as I was looking through my portfolio and I see it's being stored in the UK, uh, a lot of the bottles, I was like, I wonder if I'm just going to, instead of actually liquidating this, I'm just going to order a single bottle of all these from somewhere, wherever I can find them. I don't know if it's going to be BevMo, but certainly wine.com or somewhere else. I was like, you guys need like almost like a subscription portal where you say, you know what, you're going to invest, but we're also going to send you and you can pay to sign up for this or whatever one bottle of whatever you own just so you can drink this and, and participate feels a little more almost like you know hey i'm involved in this i see robert parker gave one of mine in 94 i'm excited about that anyway you ever have any ability to think about that because i think you guys do something with that with a whiskey perhaps but i don't want to get ahead of ourselves why is that a terrible idea a lot of folks right they're in it for more than just the hard returns right it is an experiential thing right a lot of people may already have a passion or maybe they want to develop a passion or education about what they're learning. Um, so uh, we have started doing a lot more in-person events. So for example, if you own a bottle of Dom Perignon, right? Like we did an event where the rep came, right? We identified all the folks in our, in our user base that owned that bottle. We're like, hey, you know, invite only event just because you own this bottle, come check this out, right? Um, so we started doing things like that where it's more so winery driven because they want to connect with the end user as well, but and and that's an that's an opportunity to taste. Um, but yeah, I think having some sort of way to be able to experience a little bit more of the investment, given that it is also a consumption, right, and a fun thing to do and fun thing to talk about, uh, it's definitely on our radar. Yeah, one of the things that I was curious about last time is I mentioned I'm somewhat of a thrifty slash cheap bastard. And I said, you know what, I would love to scoop up a whole portfolio of wines and just be like the bottom bid. If people get upside down, they're trading too much Nvidia, they bought a bunch, they shorted a bunch of Tesla, whatever it may be. And I say, man, I got to get rid of something. I got to sell this wine. You guys implemented what looks like, you know, somewhat of a trading I don't even know how you would describe it. Uh, not brokerage, but marketplace for wine that I'm currently scrolling through and Tell us a little bit about that. How much activity is there? Is it something that actually there's a decent amount of, of movement? How's it work? Yeah. So monthly volumes, you know, we're doing low seven figures on that, on the platform. And yeah, I think it's, it's especially for someone who I think understands a little bit more the actual item that's being traded, right? And maybe they're patient. They're like, Hey, you know, I, I want to build up a nice little collection, right? Or I want to take a bigger position than Vino Vest had recommended with my more sort of like uh, managed portfolio. You know, say, I really believe in this one wine, right? I want to just collect more of it. And I can do that on my own. I can set bids anytime I want, right? I can be alerted if someone's someone's offer gets lowered. And that's something that um, is, is still a relatively new product. So, you know, in terms of what we want to do to it, long, a long ways off from the eventual product vision. But it's cool to see people using it, right? And it's cool to see uh, participants being able to kind of set bids, hang on to it, and give people that early liquidity. Because even though most people are expecting to hold this thing for five, 10 plus years, shit happens, right? You, you have a kid, you lose a job, right? You, you do need liquidity in a pinch, and a lot of people are willing to kind of give away uh, that discount just to be able to get out quick and get their cash. I'm scrolling through and I see a couple bottles on here that are 4K plus. Is that the highest on there? Or you got some stuff that's even even higher? Yeah, we've got a few bottles. Maybe they're burgundies or, or champagnes that are pretty pricey up there right there. Those aren't going to move much, right? We're seeing most of the volume move in the sort of like 
hundred dollars to five hundred dollars a bottle range, right? Those are the ones that you know not only have good availability in terms of the supply, but you know they're they're kind of chunks that our traders can move move more frequently. I see my mom's favorite, some Chateau Neuf on here. She's very Southern and loves Chateau Neuf. Tell me a little bit about what are some of the trends in the wine industry right now? What's hot? What's not? My wife loves to order Merlot because she's convinced uh, she talked to a sommelier once that, that said that the um, Sideways movie did like 10 years of damage to the Merlot industry. And it was like always a better buy if you go to, go to a place that has a good Merlot on the, on the menu. Anyway, what's hot? What's not? What's going on in, in y'all's world? Yeah, what, what's hot is Italy and Rome, actually. So these are regions that are not as, I'd say, they don't have the same sort of you know, brand value as like Champagne or Burgundy or Bordeaux, right? But Burgundy and Bordeaux, sorry, Burgundy and Champagne have been like the stars of the past five years. They've been returning on average over 20% a year for the last five years straight. And prices were getting pretty stratospheric, right? You're seeing those 5K bottles uh, for one bottle of wine, right? Part of what was driving that price increase was the scarcity, right? Climate change plays a huge role in the wine industry. And these are regions like Champagne and Burgundy that have been particularly impacted on the supply side. So they're producing less and less, collectors were going nuts over it. Um, but now that we've seen a little bit of cool down in the, you know, in the general macro market, we've also seen a cool down in those two, in those two factors in which they're still, you know, they're still kind of sky high, but their their appreciation rate has kind of tempered down a little bit. And people are going more toward relative values. So Italian wines, right? Love Italian wines. They're usually pretty reasonable from a price point range, even the more expensive ones. So that's been the leading region this year um, in in the wine market. I think it's at about eight percent up year to date. And then Rhone as well. Rhone is a, a region which not too many people know about, but you know it has as long of a history as Champagne, Burgundy, and you know certainly longer than Napa. So that one's up around six percent year to date as well um, on the index that we're tracking. So they're both really steady buys you know, really strong fundamental blue chip regions that were kind of overlooked just because they're less flashy and don't have the marketing power of like an LVMH behind it trying to pump up a lot of the brand value. Tell me a little bit about y'all's global client base. Is it like 95% American or is it something where, um, is it even allowed to be a global investor? And, and, And part of that question too is, I'm, you know, kind of curious about, the global demand on the, the wine marketplace in general, you know, China impact in Asia, uh, Europe, you know, how the macro world with some rising inflation, various interest rates, economies, blah, blah, blah. But kind of want to get to so like the how the, the global marketplace is. Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk about our client base first and then just the global marketplace. So from a client side, I'd say about 75, 80% are still based in the US. That's where we are. That's where we're focusing our efforts. And then organically, um, about the, the remaining sort of like 20% is based in Asia. So countries like Greater China and Hong Kong, we've got Japan, Singapore, those are all our, our major regions outside the United States. And then just a little bit sprinkled everywhere else. From an availability standpoint, you're just purchasing alcohol. So as long as your country allows you to purchase alcohol, and as long as you are of drinking age, you are good to go on VinoVest. So that kind of excludes a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, right? Muslim countries as well, from the alcohol standpoint. From a global consumption standpoint, U.S. is still the biggest market, but China is projected to overtake the U.S. in terms of consumption volume by sales in the next two years. So probably by the end of 2025, China will be that new new number one. And especially as COVID policies are now being loosened, right? Things are opening up. Again, now, especially in Hong Kong, which was always traditionally sought, uh, seen to be more of a window into Asia, right? It's, it's zero tax, really, really great for import export. So we're seeing a lot more activity come out of Asia, especially on the buying side. So a lot of the, the folks that we sell to when we eventually sell our wines, more of those Asian buyers who were previously doors closed are now open for business. It just reminded me that I saw an investment opportunity years ago for Yao Ming's winery. Are there any celebrities? I mean, I see tons. I feel like every day I see a different celebrity that, you know, is, has a label or is getting into the wine game. I was actually up in Healdsburg a couple weekends ago, and I absolutely love uh, that part of the world. It's also a good beer country, too. Yeah, it's beautiful up there. 
It's so pretty. Are there any uh, in particular celebrity labels that you think are drinkable or delicious that are wonderful? Has anyone gotten it right in that world of actor, athlete, uh, celebrities that you can think of? That's actually one of my favorite topics because I I pretty much had them all, you know, from Snoop Dogg's $10 red blend to, uh, to Yao Ming's wines, which are like 200 something bucks a bottle, right? Oh. Um, so a lot of these winemakers or these athletes slash celebrities, you got to differentiate between them just slapping their face on a brand and them not being involved at all with the viticultural side of it with someone like Yao Ming or someone like CJ McCollum, who they bought the land, they cultivated the vines, right? They're very involved with the winemaking process and it's, you know, fully vertically integrated with what they like to drink and who they are. So for the ones where it's more the latter case, you know, there's some great wines out there. Dwayne Wade makes his own wine and Wade Cellar is really, really great rosé. I've loved it. And especially um, now that we're in the summer, something that I'll be buying by the caseload. Carmelo Anthony just started his own winery in France in Chateauneuf du Pop as well. So your mom, your mom will probably like that one um, when it gets released. Um, and then you've got athletes like Yao Ming or, or CJ McCollum um, that are just huge, huge wine lovers, right? And they've got their own winery. They, you know, they're, it's, it's fully a business for them, right? It's not just a, a marketing thing. More importantly, Mello was Denver Nugget. I got my Game 5 uh, NBA Finals hat. I joked on Twitter for a while because it was really problematic getting there because I had kindergarten graduation the next morning and my flight proceeded to get delayed by seven hours. But I made it with about two minutes to spare, still wearing all of my Nuggets gear. Probably smelled a fright, but I was there. That's good. I'm going to buy some D. Wade wine then and, and give it a taste test. Yeah. Wade Cellars at the Rosé. It's really delicious. It's funny because we've talked on the show before about maybe 20 plus years ago where celebrities, athletes tended to be contra signals on getting involved in the entrepreneurship world. But to me, it's really transformed to where so many have been exceptionally successful in the past 10 to 20 years. I mean, recently we see Ryan Reynolds and George Clooney and on and on and on the Williams sisters um, that have just done. So it's been fun to watch. You know, what's interesting listeners. We've also done some farming podcasts as far as alt sort of asset classes. And I saw actually a few come across my desk on some acre trader vineyards. I didn't invest in them, so I don't know uh, if they were how interesting they were, but they were in California and I was very tempted. So then you could just have the entire ecosystem of the wine world where you're collecting the bottles um, as well as farming the land without all the hard work. It may be a future uh, partnership for you guys one day. Yeah, absolutely. There's a few. I think they're they're in the central coast of California that, um, you know, pretty solid yields, right? And they're giving you maybe eight, eight to ten percent a year, right? And you're able to also say you're a part time vineyard owner, which is pretty cool. Been trying to convince my brother in law. He's up that way to. Uh, he's got a little bit of land to plant some vines, but thus far he's he's not uh, not interested. So it's a lot of work. When's you guys' next event going to be, man? I know we'll come join you guys. We'll co-host it. Uh, are you guys going to do any more producer sort of meetups uh, this summer? Summertime's a good time to do it. Yeah, I think I think we will be doing some because especially in the summer, like right before harvest, right? That's where a lot of the the winery folks are a little bit more available. Right during the fall, they're just all out focusing on the harvest, bottling all of that. So. Well, subscribe to Anthony's Twitter feed, and he'll announce it. Do you guys do much? I mean, I would assume you do, but I don't know. Um, in sort of the social world, as far as marketing, like where do most of your clients come from? Is it sort of word of mouth? Are you doing heavy into TikTok content? Like where do people find you guys? Yeah, so uh, still a lot of it is on traditional performance marketing channels, you know, your Facebook rules of the world, but we're really leaning heavy on content, especially stuff from our own blogs because people are searching about wine, whiskey, alternative assets, right? Uh, alcohol stocks all the time, right? And we've kind of built ourselves into a pretty big authority in, in that space. So if you, if you're searching, Hey, like what are the best vintages of Dom Perignon? Odds are you're probably browsing on our blog and that's a great sort of in to be like, Oh, right. This is, you know, not only drinking Dom Perignon, you can invest in it. Right. And there's this great website called Vinovest that makes it all very simple for you to do. One of the fun insights, and you guys probably know this better than I do, but I remember over a decade ago, we were chatting with some friends that are big skiers that did a lot of writing, but in kind of backcountry Japan and other worldwide locations. But 
particularly the more esoteric you get. I mean, obviously, if you're writing about Dom, there's going to be a million articles about it. But if you're writing about maybe a specific vintage or a weird or different producer, you may end up being in the top you know, three on Google. Some of your little local places in Tuscany or in Italy, you know, you end up being a much higher opportunity anyway. People are always searching out the weird ones too. Yeah, exactly. And with the wine world, right? Every single, it's not just Don Perignon, every single vintage year, right? 2008, 2009, 2010. Every single one of those is a long tail keyword opportunity for us. So we try to win on all of those small ones because they all add up and it's a lot easier to rank than just the main keyword. All right. Well, listeners, when you see me as the, uh, is the low bid on all these VinoVest uh, trading marketplaces? Don't laugh because I'm definitely gonna gonna put my algo on there if I could. Let's talk a little bit about whiskey. So I saw this news. I got pretty excited about it because to me, this is an area that I haven't seen as much going on, and I got all uh, all hot and bothered about it. Uh, emailed you, said Anthony, I got to get under cap table. I love what's going on. Please, what do you got for me? So tell me about this whiskey offering. What do you guys got going on? How's it work? Is it the same thing as wine, just with a different liquid? Or how'd you guys think about it? And how'd you arrive at whiskey? Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of start at how we thought about it and arrived at I can then talk a little bit more about how the product offering works. But uh, it really started all as an experiment. We, you know, we heard from a lot of our existing investors, like, hey, like, you guys ever think about doing whiskey? We're like, no, we're VinoVest, right? We're, you know, maybe in the future, right? But we want to focus on wine. Um, what we did do, though, was we threw up a landing page with a wait list. And that wait list, uh, we started at the beginning of last year. It went from about zero to 4,000 people in the first six months. And then we looked at it at the end of the year, it went from 4,000 to nearly 15,000. And we hadn't really paid attention to it, but we were like, oh, my God, there's 15,000 people who signed up for whiskey. It really would be resp- irresponsible not to give the people what they want. So what we did then was like, all right let's figure out how we can be able to launch a product that has the same features, makes it just as easy for an investor to invest in whiskey as in wine. And the sort of key difference in wine and whiskey is that the wine, it it sort of ages and develops in the bottle, right? On the whiskey side though, it's really all in the barrel. Once the whiskey is bottled, you know, the proof stays the same. It doesn't turn from an 18 year to a 20 year in the bottle all that maturation and therefore all that price appreciation happens in the barrel. So then we thought to ourselves, all right, how in the world are we going to figure out how to invest in giant barrels? We've got to move further up the supply chain, right? So we started working with actual whiskey suppliers and the actual brands. And what we realized was there was a really interesting opportunity, almost like a working capital play where um, even a big brand like Diageo, right? They're going to make a, an 18 year Macallan They can't really have a barrel on their balance sheet for 18 years that's not generating revenue and only creating cost, right? So then what we realized that a lot of these brands do is they're selling them to investors, giving giving a range of returns or sometimes even a fixed return and a fixed buyback date and allowing others to be able to own it. And you can sell it back to the brand, they'll bottle it. You can actually work with an independent bottler and actually bottle it under a private label or you can sell at auction, right? So there's a number of different exit options, uh, but we thought this was super unique, right? It's even harder to store an entire barrel of whiskey than it is a case of wine. So we thought this was even more special when it comes to our mission of really breaking down barriers and, and creating access. So that's what our whiskey product does. You're gonna invest an entire barrel, all of it's yours, and you can choose what to do with it, right? Bottle it, sell at auction, sell it back to the brand, and you get your option now between Scotch, so a lot of the major brands, Macallan, Bowmore, Ardmore, and then on the American side, a lot more conventional brands like like High West, Whistle Pig, and things like that. I actually went to the High West Distillery this past winter. It was actually wonderful. The one in I think it's in Park City, right? Yeah, outside they have the like traditional bar downtown, but they have the the actual distillery. Uh, maybe I don't know, 20, 30 minutes away and beautiful location. What was like the decision? Because like theoretically you could have gone the route of, hey, we're gonna buy bottles of Hibiki or this fancy scotch and it'd be like a bottle based kind of conceptual versus like this barrel based. Is it something that you're 
considering both or there was a just decision to go full cask as opposed to you know kind of the bottle concept that you went with more similar to the the wine world yeah so it was really more of a fundamental analysis where when we looked at wine right there are two main factors from a fundamental side that drive price appreciation in wine number one is ageability right so a one-year-old wine of 2021 vintage is going to taste different than when we're in 2030 and it's nine years old. And secondly, it's that supply and demand, right? If you decide to ship your wine home and drink a case of it, that means that there's six bottles less in the world and then price will go up. So we see the same factors in the barrel side, right? When we're aging the barrel, we have that appreciation. It is going to taste different. Um, And then you have that scarcity as well, right? The angel share decreasing the actual volume of alcohol in the barrel where we feel really good from a fundamental analysis side. From the bottle side, you only have that scarcity play, right? Maybe there's only 300 bottles produced and then it's really just based on who else is drinking it, right? There's That bottle is going to stay the same and you're really kind of at the mercy of the market. So we thought that by starting with barrels first, not to say that we won't ever do bottles, there's just a stronger fundamental play for investing in those, those barrels. I kind of like the idea of buying a cask and then and and bottling it and, and doing it for Cambria giveaways. So when you say cask, I'm terrible at public math, but like how many bottles is in a cask? Do you have any idea? Yeah. So for a traditional hogshead, which is the the barrel size that most of our um, most of our barrels in, it's about 300, 350 bottles. So depending on the age, right? A little bit less if the barrel gets older and the evaporation, but that's kind of the general range that you can look at. There's a pretty big spread between the American and ultra rare Scotch casks. Can you talk a little bit about the options here as far as the American whiskey versus the Scotch offerings and how you can go about reserving one? Yeah. So on the American side, that's our more entry level product. We're buying new make. So this is just brand new barrel, right? Brand new alcohol, and you're starting from age zero. So that's why the price point's a lot lower. And in general, American whiskey is just cheaper on the retail market than scotch. Um, on the scotch side, you're typically buying something that already has at least five to eight years of age on it. Um, mm-hmm. So you've got all that appreciation built in, and it is usually branded. So you know that it's a Macallan cask, or you know that it's an Ardmore cask. Whereas with our American cask, it's pretty much neutral until a brand decides to scoop it up and kind of add their special uh, recipe to it. Do you have any current favorites in this world? Um, we had a Kentucky friend that gifted us a bottle of rabbit hole, rabbit something that was wonderful. Nice surprise from uh, some local Kentucky crew. Anything uh, that you've come across that have been particularly um, interesting? I think on the American side, you know, I'm, I'm certainly a big fan of whatever Sazerac produces. You know, they're a big conglomerate. They have a, a number of brands and it's, you know, in the industry, it's particularly prized to get your hands on a Sazerac barrel. You know, and on the Scotch side, I'd say like probably Ardmore is my favorite. Um, so we've got a few barrels there that are, um, you know, maybe 12 year, 18 year. And I've also personally had about a 12 year Highland Park cask. And that's our, that's our Vino Vest IPO barrel. So it's something that we, we bought right when the company started, I think it was about eight years old and now, now it's 12 years. So when we go IPO, we're going to be bottling that and giving all of our employees and investors, um, a, a bottle of it. The startup ecosystem, you know, for many has been a struggle the past couple, past year or two, I guess, um, funding has dried up. You're starting to see some companies fail. We were chatting about a company in your world that um, just kind of overnight, you know, just announced, hey, we're, we're gone, which you see on occasion, which is always kind of surprising. You see companies that are like, hey, we're doing awesome. You know, everything's going wonderful. And then literally it's just like, just kidding, we're, we're, we're done. But that's, you know, part of this startup world, like the, the challenges and everything with it. You know, as you guys build this, what are some of the challenges in the last couple of years? Did you get caught up in the Silicon Valley? bank mess? Um, is funding a challenge? What's been your experience of the this world that you're involved in last year or two? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, we're really fortunate, I think, in the asset class that we operate in. 
right? We're still a fintech, but when we're looking at our peers, right, most of them were in traditional stocks or crypto, right? Massive swings in prices led to massive swings in their balance sheet, right? In in the trading fees that they can collect, in the AUM fees that they can collect. And, you know, we were we were definitely jealous of them in, in 2020, 2021, when they were just posting crazy user number growth, crazy demand. And we we're like, all right, we're still chugging along, right? Our investors are happy with 15%. And now that, you know, they've had a down year like last year where, you know, everything's just cratered under them. We've also just been really lucky to be chugging along like, all right, we delivered investors, you know, a, a low double digit return again. So I think just given the nature of the asset class, given the mentality of our investors who are all just very long-term, this is kind of a small piece of their portfolio, right? No one's got, no one's got a significant portion of their investment portfolio in wine. And it's something that they kind of just set and forget and expect to be pretty happy a few years down the line. I think we've also kind of taken that mentality to just be slow and steady, not really get caught up in the hype or kind of the new things and just focus on building for the long-term. Um, and I think that's really helped us out in terms of um, not kind of giving into the whims of the market. Now we're kind of at this break-even cash level where we can just survive indefinitely without additional venture capital funding. So we've also been able to kind of future-proof ourselves for any sort of future downturn in the market, not have to rely on VC funding and just be able to grow really sustainably and organically because we made this promise to our investors four years ago that it's a 10-year investment. So we need to be around in 10 years. I love scrolling through your website as I contemplate buying a cask right now, but there was a really interesting stat to, to totally take a hard left turn here. But listeners, see if you can guess the top five whiskey consuming countries and just think about them in your head. Number one is a total shocker to me. The answer you guys have is India. Yeah. What's, what's going on in India? I mean, I know there's just a shite ton of people there, but uh, I didn't know that uh, such big whiskey drinkers. Yeah, I think the, the true answer is there's a shite ton of people there. It's three times the size, listeners, of the U.S. whiskey consuming total. So we got 462 million liters in the U.S., 1.5 billion liters in India. You know, this reminds me of, a, I heard a statistic the other day, and they were talking about fantasy sports and how it's, you know, taking off and all the websites and, and offerings that are making money off this. And they said, did you know they actually the biggest fantasy sport is cricket? And I was like, what are you talking about cricket? And they're like, yeah, in India, it's actually like, you know, a massive industry is fantasy sports about cricket. And I said, no kidding. So yeah, just like sheer numbers. Uh, it's amazing the scale of what happens. But yeah, I've actually had Indian whiskey as well before. So it, it makes sense that they're the number one country by volume. Right. Not by not by sales dollars, because that yeah. is a I think it's just in, you know, it might not even be in barrel or like new barrels. They might just be putting like wood chips in stainless steel tanks, aging it for like three months and calling it, quote unquote. The weirdest place I ever had whiskey was in Bhutan, did a trip with my mom and had some uh, local whiskey and went to a joint that had karaoke and it was a little different there because instead of getting yourself up to sing which i was very happy not to do you actually would pay the waiter or the waitress to go sing a song for you which was a little different style but it was fun but uh enjoyed it i can't remember the name of it but it was not too bad i've never had an indian whiskey yeah it's pretty good i mean it's definitely whiskey to drink right not whiskey to think about and ponder and as I think about contemplate buying a cask, anything else I should be thinking about, or you're listening to, you're talking to people who are in this world, anything we skipped over on the whiskey side that you think is particularly insightful or interesting or um, something they should consider? I think the other consideration, right, on, on buying a cask, right, is thinking about where it fits into your time horizon strategy. The benefit of American whiskey is that it is pretty short term in comparison, you can be able to get a return in two to four years, whereas scotch, right, it's at least five years, right? It's the age of those products that you see in market, right? 18 year, 21 year, 25 year, that's when the prices really start to skyrocket. Whereas the, uh, the American whiskey market, people are still drinking it young. So that'd be kind of the biggest factor in my mind, um, if, if I were in your shoes right now. One of the topics that I certainly read a lot about 
over the past 10 years, not so much in the last five, was there was a number of companies, scientists, startups trying to condense that aging process from, you know, 10, 20, 50 years down to like three months. Has there been much success there? I know there's groups that have claimed they discovered the secret to accelerating that aging process, but it doesn't seem like it's really translated into brands and sales. Is that right? Or what? Give us an overview of. Yeah, I've heard those headlines too, or seen them, you know, maybe four or five years ago. And to be honest, I haven't heard much buzz about it since. Um, you know, I haven't heard, I think maybe from the taste standpoint, even if it is identical, um, there's still the brand value, right? There's still the sort of respect of craftsmanship, of time, of that sort of artisanal value that people buy along with the brand. And I think another part of it is the scarcity, right? People want the one of 300 bottles that's a special collection or collaboration with some artist versus this sort of like mass produced, like we can taste like an 18 year old scotch, but we're actually made in the lab for six months type of thing. So I think there's going to be many reasons why it'll never be the same, but I think it's cool to the casual drinker who may not be able to afford, you know, on, on a weekly basis, that sort of same taste profile. You know, there used to be, this is funny. There used to be a distillery in LA that kind of claimed to do this called lost spirits. Yeah. They do really cool tours by the way. Yeah. Well, the, the joke I was going to say was that I went on the tour and it was amazing and it was more like a Disneyland of rum or whiskey, whatever it was than anything. And, and I, and I did the math and I was like, wait a minute, you guys make like two or $3 million from this tour. I was like, I don't, the rum is sort of irrelevant to this whole <laughs> business. And I just looked it up as we're talking and it's now Lost Spirits Distillery and Modern Cirque Show in Las Vegas. And it's an entire whole production. Yeah. I mean, it's like they have like 40 resident performers, one of the largest production show casts in Las Vegas, which seemingly has nothing to do with rum or whiskey, but I guess that's kind of the point. So whatever. Yeah. I remember going there for a friend's birthday party and you know, you're just in there. It's a really cool experience and you know, it's, it's a lot of drinking, right? Like you, it's very different than wine tasting. If you're just taking shots of different types of rum and spirits, you come out the other end and you're like, Whoa. Yeah. Interesting. Well, when you guys do the Vino Vest tour, let us know, sign me up. What else going on? What do we, what do we skipped over today? That's particularly interesting. I know that there's a barrel shortage. I was listening to a, a odd lots with that Bloomberg crew and they uh, did a whole episode on why there's no barrels. Um, is that something that affects you guys at all? Or is more a curiosity or what's, uh, what's going on there? Yeah. So that's, you know, there's because of the American Oak shortage, right? It's really hard to find new make barrels. Um, and that's also why we're, I believe, the only company in the United States that offers new make barrels um, available to the public, right? It's usually just swooped up long-term contracts by one of these big five conglomerates that just use it for their own production. So um, it is hard to find those new make barrels. It's definitely gonna be harder and harder to find them. So that's why we're, we're pretty proud to be able to have that as an offering for the general public. Very cool. Well, I'll add a link in the show notes to that Odd Lots episode. It's fun to listen to. Is that mainly a COVID thing or is that just more of a, a supply demand of these guys? Um, I haven't listened to that particular episode, but from what we know from our industry partners, it's really the, the oak shortage, um, right? American oak, to make those barrels, they got to grow for a couple of decades. And the increase in demand for those types of barrels has greatly outpaced the you know the speed that these these trees can even grow. So I'm sure there's now a company that's trying to speed up uh, oak tree production or growth, and that whoever figures that out is going to make a ton of money. Yeah. What do we skipped over today that you think is particularly interesting? We can talk about whiskey, wine. Is there something you're like, oh man, we we got to cover this? We haven't uh, we haven't touched on. It. Is there anything on your brain? No, I think we covered pretty much everything. Right, a little bit of whiskey, a little bit of wine. A little bit of fun in between that, but I think um, really always just get to enjoy chopping up with you, Meb. So thanks again for having me on. All right, give us some picks, man. In the last twelve months, what have you been drinking that we can add to my uh, order list? That's been 
a delight, a surprise, wonderful. Um, I follow you on Twitter, so I cat. I always write down. I got you're in my save folder a lot because I see you uh, drinking some good stuff, and I say, all right, I'm going to add that to the list. But for the listeners, what's some good things that you've sampled over the past year? So I've definitely been in a pretty fortunate position, especially coming off of that that honeymoon in Italy, where I had a ton of great Italian wine. So um, I'd say in terms of a red wine, uh, the Sassicaia 2020. So it's a super Tuscan, which means it's mainly a, a Cabernet blend uh, with with some other Bordeaux grapes. Um, still very, very young. So this is definitely the one to keep in your wine fridge for a few years and you open it up on a special occasion, you'll be very, very happy. If you're not that into red wine, you're looking for white wine, I would go in the direction of white Burgundy, going to uh, a sub-region called Chablis. So there's a producer called Vincent Davisat, um, and he farms this little village called La Forest. Um, and it's a really incredible, crisp white wine. And the, and the name of the brand is La Forest? Uh, the, kind of like the sub name, right? So it's a Vincent Davisat, Chablis, Premier Cru, and La Forest is like that specific one that they make because he makes a few different bottles of white wine. And that one's like, you know, not your, not your grandma's like super buttery Chardonnay that I think a lot of people have started getting turned off by. This is like very, very vibrant, perfect with food, perfect on its own. And it's one of the best white wines for the price range that I've ever had. Ooh. What's been the most memorable one you had in the past year? Is there one that sticks out as uh, being particularly uh, memorable? It's got to be the one that we had during our team retreat in December. So you know, after three years of COVID, for the first time, we had a full company team retreat. And uh, we asked everybody to bring a bottle to blind taste. So we put a little sleeve over everything. And you know, we've got folks who have passed the master sommelier exam. We've got people who you know, just like to drink something. Uh, so it was a good range of palettes. And uh, we had a a bottle of 1992 Domaine de la Romani Conti wine, which is uh, retails for nearly $30,000 that I, I put into the blind tasting sleeve. And just to see the reaction on people's faces when we finally did the reveal, uh, priceless. What did, did it get some good reviews? Because we did this with my family. And let me be clear, listeners, my family is perfectly happy probably drinking Boone. So we had like the Costco... And then we had some fancy bottles and some less fancy bottles. And, and we always, we joked afterwards because the Costco was always rated as like a seven or eight. It was never like a two or a 10. They make some solid wine. They just nailed it every time. But the fancy and the, and again, this isn't a bunch of um, sommeliers, but the really good and the really bad would swap places. <laughs> People would be um, high up on uh, whatever the fancy was. So did this one at least get some good reviews, I hope? Yeah, I mean, we tasted over over 20 wines that night, and that one was a top three consensus for everyone. Like, everyone knew this was quality, but I don't think anyone would have guessed that it was, you know, a 30, you know, yeah. I just imagine the guilt spilling some of that on your shirt and be like, that's like $500, those drops right there. Like, I feel I can't even take this to the cleaners. I'm, I feel so bad. The shirt is now worth more than it was uh, prior to spilling it. <laughs> that's a great fashion statement to have. Like, this stain is, this stain is $500. We, uh, we did that once with whiskey, and my favorite was like Jack Daniels, so, uh, which I purport to like not even like. So I was like, wait a minute. What, I, this, this, is, uh, this is great. So, all right, I got a couple on my list. Good. The thing I love about blind tasting, right? It definitely humbles you. And you kind of shake away your preconceptions and you just kind of come in open and you know, kind of see what you're feeling. About. Yeah, I think it would be fun to try to go down the sommelier certification path. There's so much to know. And some, and like, I definitely don't have the palate. My nose has been broken enough to where I, I, I'm convinced. I just like, there's no, there's no hope. I think I could get reasonable, but my wife is like... I mean, she can, she's like a bloodhound. So uh, I think it'd be fun to do, but um, so many hours in the day. Yeah, definitely a fun hobby to do together, right? It's not too hard to pass that intro certification. And a lot of it is just like kind of more technical items that really anybody can learn and use a lot, right? Use it every single restaurant you go to. Yeah. Anthony, what, uh, where do people go? Obviously following you on Twitter. You guys got an account on Instagram, you know, vinovest.com, uh, or dot co, excuse me. 
uh, great place to be. Where else? Come find us at vinovest.co. You can sign up for both wine and whiskey. Uh, my personal email is anthony at vinovest.co. So always love hearing from y'all, whether it's uh, whether it's just tell me what to drink, pairing with what. I've had readers come up and, uh, and ask me that or you know, more complex investment related question. I am happy to hear it all. So um, yeah, please email me or follow me on Twitter. Always happy to continue the combo. Very cool. We'll put the links in the show notes, listeners. And when uh, Cambria opens our cask and or gets uh, all of our bottles sampled, we'll have to throw some sort of party. I need to get a partnership with the Cambria Winery up in up the coast a little bit. We need to tell them we uh, we got to get a, a, a cut of deal so we can send some Cambria wines to people. Anthony, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, likewise. It's been a pleasure, man.